Good evening and welcome to the OSA, uh, OSA and Loader 1 Advanced Fitting Webinar. Um, so this evening we're going to go through um, the sizing and application of the unloader, but also um, a few little tips in terms of accessories you can use to solve some of the problems that you might face and also just um, hints and tips as we go along. So just to make sure that you're, you're getting a really good fit and the best outcome for your patient. First of all, a little bit of information about OSA as a company. We're an Icelandic company. We're based uh, in Reykjavik in terms of our global headquarters. It's about 3,000 employees throughout the whole of the world. Um, we make a variety of different orthoses in terms of spinal orthoses, osteoarthritis orthoses, and knee braces. Um, we also originated as a prosthetic company, so making things like the carbon fiber running blades that you see uh, in the Paralympics. Equally, power knees and also prosthetic hands, so the, the um, uh, the team from Touch Bionics has formed part of OSRA as well. Um, so what I'm going to do first of all is just talk you through um, the webinar setup and also the team of people that we've got here to help us with this. So uh, my name is Giles Leeming. I'm a clinical specialist orthotist based at Stockport where we're transmitting this from. It's my colleague Peter Gill. Um, he's the area sales manager for Yorkshire and he's going to be the, uh, the leg that we're going to fit all these braces on. And what I'm going to do now is just go over to the table which is directly over here and this just shows you the view that I can um, talk you through the application of the actual system itself. So you can see See, we've got a variety of different accessories here there will be an unloader here in a moment from there we then go over to the fitting cam where you can see a view of Pete um, and this just means I can talk you through um, the fitting of the brace and also the fitting of the different accessories if we go back to the main camera um, I can also then show you another member of our team which is Izzy um, and Izzy's got a mobile camera so from the mobile camera we can actually highlight uh, specific bits and she can follow uh, Pete as he walks around wearing the brace um, and then if we go back to the main camera um, there's important to mention the last two members of our team so if you check on the Q&A part um, it's on the bottom um, of your your window if you type any questions that you have in there they'll be answered by our national sales manager Stuart Hogg um, so he's manning that and Equally, we have uh, our technical monkey, which is Mike, and he is, uh, there he is, he's a bit camera shy, and he's controlling all the cameras. So if we're having any problems, change between cameras, you know that it's uh, technical monkey difficulty. Okay, so moving on to the brace, it's a clinically proven lightweight treatment option um, and we've got a bit of an agenda here. So we're going to go through an overview, a basic fitting, your normal fitting in a normal patient group, um, an uh, unloader accessory overview, so some of the different accessories. You'll see all the codes and all the names in our catalogue, so it just gives us an opportunity to show you what they are and what they're used for, a little bit about troubleshooting and then plenty of time for questions at the end. In terms of indications, um, the unload is used for mild to severe unicompartmental osteoarthritis and there's a lot of studies to support this. So originally when we developed it, we were generally thinking for Kelgren launch grade 2 and 3. However, the studies have shown that it can be effective um, all the way up to Kelgren launch grade 4 um, for osteoarthritis. Um, it's also been um, significantly used in other unicompartmental knee conditions that require load reduction. And, and we're going to kind of work through this list as we go through. On the right you can see um, a, a knee with unicompartmental osteoarthritis and in this case it's a medial one. So starting first of all with a little bit of information about microfracture. Um, so in, uh, uh, you've got a defect in the cartilage. Um, so when this is, when this is uh, the, you have this situation, um, you can see that there is an area, uh, a defect in that actual cartilage. So we can use microfracture treatment in order to uh, prepare that area. So you can see it's just uh, removing that uh, periosteal coating over the bone. And then you can see that there's um, some microfracturing. So a probe is placed um, going through the cortical bone into the spongy bone underneath. And this encourages infiltration of, of stem cells um, from the bone marrow into form this blood clot, which is in the center um, of, the, of the bottom picture. And that's quite a sensitive area. Um, and you can see on the um, arthroscopy picture above, you've got these areas um, where these punctures have been made um, in order to get infiltration um, of the stem cells into the joint. So what's important is that we protect that area, that blood clot is, is protected and supported um, so that we don't damage it while that fibrosis and forms fibrous cartilage. 
Moving on to other, um, other uh, operations, we also have the osteoarticular transfer system or OATS procedure, also known as mosaic plasty. And in these uh, procedures, we're actually taking small donor sites of, of good cartilage in a lot of cases, these are taken from the margins of the patellofemoral joint. And then these plugs, which you can see, there's a small plug of uh, bone at the bottom. We've got a cancellous bone, the cortical bone, and then the articular cartilage on the top. And then these are then placed into the defect either side. So those plugs go into that defect. And the pink areas around it infiltrate again um, in the same way with, with microfracture treatment, infiltrate uh, with stem cells, um, and then those form fiber, fiber cartilage in between those. But um, you can see it forms a mosaic style to cover over that, that defect. Next one is a Macy or matrix autologous chondrocyte implant implantation. Now this is a little bit more unusually done in the UK because of the cost, um, but effectively in this procedure, they're doing a small um, arthroscopy to take a small area of cartilage out. This is sent to a lab in Germany where they then culture a sheet um, of cartilage, of your own cartilage, um, which can then be sutured up to shape and then sutured back into the defect on either side. Um, so you can, uh, sorry, on one side. This is then sutured in and then PRP or platelet rich plasma is, is uh, injected back into, this, into that defect and you can see it fills this cavity in behind. So what's important is that we protect that area, um, potentially reduce the load from that area because normally with a lot of these procedures, we would be changing um, we would be reducing the load in that area using uh, minimal weight bearing procedures, using crutches and so forth. It just means we're reducing the load in that area through, through other means. Other, other couple of indications are tibial plateau fractures. So you can see on that picture on the left, we've got a tibial plateau fracture down there. Um, and as long as that's stable, potentially you can conservatively manage that by load reduction using an unloader. And equally with a AVN, um, obviously that bone can uh, become easy to deform whilst in that necrotic stage before it uh, revascularizes. Um, so it's important to, re to control the amount of load that's going through those areas. Um, and you can do that with an unloader. Um, another area is high tibial osteotomies. Um, so an unloader is often used in these instances um, when they want to test the methodology of reducing the load in that uh, unicompartmental uh, affected osteoarthritic knee. So in a high tibial osteotomy, you can see this triangle here. And what this is effectively doing, they take that triangle of bone out. So you can see before this operation is done, that knee is in a various position. And by removing it along this line and then placing a plate and two screws like that, you can see that we've effectively changed the tibial varum uh, and we've now got a more straight leg. And the, the, the function of that is to shift the load line from more, um, a more medially uh, directed line um, to moving it a bit more laterally to control that. So you can use an unloader to predict how effective that surgery will be. Okay, um, also uh, in unicompartmental knee replacements, prior to doing the surgery and replacing that compartment, we can actually predict how effective that, that intervention will be by using an unloader uh, and reducing the load in that side. So if we get good symptomatic relief, we can then progress on to doing a new unicompartmental knee replacement. We're seeing a lot more patients with degenerative meniscal tears, and this is a difficult one to manage um, because um, from a surgical perspective, it's been shown that it isn't very effective to operate uh, on these knees. So what we want is a way of reducing the load and allowing that to settle. Um, obviously, it is difficult for, for meniscal tissue uh, to heal. So it's important to try and keep that patient active and maintain normal activity levels. Now, in terms of our goals, we're trying to reduce the pain and then so increase the activity level for the patient. The hope with this um, is that we're going to delay surgery and enhance their quality of life. And the studies have actually shown that it is possible to reduce the, uh, the, reduce the need uh, for both over-the-counter and prescription-only medicines. Um, the NICE guidelines for osteoarthritis from 2014 actually say that patients who have biomechanical joint pain should be considered for assessment for bracing as an adjunct to their core treatments. So it is supported by the guidelines within the UK. 
So this is actually taken from the NICE guidelines uh, and this is really the patient journey that they normally have once they go to the doctor. So we start at this initial stage, the patient goes to the doctor and is giving education and advice and information access, whether that's um, access to information from Arthritis Research UK, you see a lot of those leaflets and that sort of thing uh, in GP surgeries. Also strengthening exercises, improving the strength uh, and aerobic fitness of the patient and also weight loss. The, the BMI and the, the weight of the patient has a significant effect on the knee. So in a lot of patients, um, methods of reducing uh, their weight can have significant effects on improving the symptoms that they're feeling. When they next sort of progress, uh, they're then going into this uh, intermediate ring here, um, which gives us um, two different types of pain medication, but it's effectively symptomatic relief. So we've got paracetamol, we've also got to topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, so like I believe gel, ibuprofen gel, that sort of thing. Um, from there, we then go to this final uh, sort of ring that's around the outside, and at the top section, we have stronger pain medications, so we have opium-based drugs, intra-articular injections of, of steroid, uh, capsaicin, which is actually sort of chilly, uh, chilly ointment that blocks some of the pain, and also um, oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, so um, ibuprofen and so on. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got local heat and cold, um, so heat packs, cold packs, that sort of thing, and assistive devices, which for myself as an orthotist, I was thinking that's where, that's where I come in. But in actual fact, this is referring to Zimmer frames, uh, walking aids, and that sort of thing. Down the bottom section, we have the um, surgical related uh, interventions. So whether that's partial or total joint replacement. And then on the left-hand side, we've got the, um, the interventions where we as clinicians can come in um, looking uh, at different options from bracing support point of view. So at the bottom, we have manual therapy, physiotherapy, TENS machines, shock absorbing insoles and shoes, because that's a big function of the cartilage that's been worn away as part of the osteoarthritic process. And then here we have bracing and supports. Okay, um, so this is the main intervention uh, that we can use to, to try and support that. And again, we're using a biomechanical intervention to support a biomechanical issue. Um, so here we have a unicompartmental knee, quite a severe one, I'll give you that, but you can see it's in a significant varus position. We've got a lot of load that's going through that medial compartment, and what we're wanting to do is reduce the load that goes through there and also shift our load line more laterally. And what the unloader is hoping to do is apply this three-point pressure system through using the frame um, above and below those two shells and then the straps that go either side of the knee. We're applying a three-point pressure in order to create this force system. So by applying a valgus force to a varus knee, we're reducing the load that's in that medial compartment but it's not necessarily about creating sort of space between that articular surface. It's about shifting that load line more laterally, but also um, reducing the impact that the patient is feeling um, at that, that articular surface. A lot of the patients that come to us are saying that they're getting discomfort on descending slopes, descending stairs, and these are activities where you get very high peaks um, of pressure um, in that joint. Now there's a range of different orthoses um, that we have um, to use for different patient types. So these are all part of our osteoarthritis range. Um, so looking on the right hand side, we have the rebound jewel. Um, and this is designed to combine um, unloading technology using a DFS strap with um, ligament control. So you can see that there's a, uh, a ligament base, uh, lig ligament brace um, combined with a DFS strap to give that unloading. The brace can also be adjusted here on either side to accommodate varicel valgus angulation. So you can actually adjust it according to the uh, position of the leg. Looking to the left hand side, uh, we have the unloader light. So this is a very cosmetic brace. It's not quite released yet, um, but it will be soon. Um, so it's based around a sleeve. Very, very lightweight. So this weighs about 296 grams, designed to fit underneath clothing, be very cosmetic and very quick and easy to fit. So with this one, um, it can actually be washed by putting it in a, in a, in a washing machine. It comes with a small bag for that. Um, and it just means that it can be washed very quickly and very easily. In the center, we then have the rebound cartilage. Um, so with this one, 
Um, this is designed for patients who have cartilage-based lesions. So it's designed uh, to apply the same three-point pressure system, but the major difference in which this changes is because it's applying this at a different stage um, throughout uh, the gait cycle. So with a standard unloader, it's designed to apply that pressure from 20 to 25 degrees to full extension, with a rebound cartilage from 45 degrees to full extension. I'm just gonna show you a little video. So this patient has a cartilage-based lesion from about 45 degrees to full extension. So looking inside of the knee, you can see that there's this area a um, little bit further back on the condyles. So it's important to apply that pressure earlier in the gait cycle. With an osteoarthritic knee, and we have a patient here with, with osteoarthritis, from 25 degrees to full extension, we're wanting to apply that unloading. So you can see when we look inside the knee, um, that that area of wear is more towards the front surface, um, more where we associate it with, with full extension, so the last 20 degrees. So you can see we use these dependent on where the lesion is located. With, with um, cartilage lesions, they're often sustained in increasing flexion as opposed to the area affected in osteoarthritis. With regards to the studies um, that have been done on the inloader, it's the most uh, researched osteoarthritis brace that's available on the market. And there's a variety of studies um, looking at uh, the compliance, looking at the pain relief, um, and um, also looking at its cost effectiveness um, as a method to bridge and delay surgery in unicompartmental knee osteoarthritis. This is a study done in 2017, last year in Bridge End, and they did an eight year prospective study looking at 63 patients um, with unicompartmental osteoarthritis, and they collected EQ5D uh, data, and this enabled them to do a quality comparison between unloader usage in comparison to total knee replacement. The key findings um, is that 39% of these patients didn't require surgery after two years, and it was a similar quality gain when compared to total knee replacement at eight-year follow-up. And the quality gains were well within the acceptable pounds per quality uh, threshold as accepted by NICE. So this is uh, sort of fits in with the NICE guidelines in terms of cost effectiveness too. So we're going to go on to uh, advanced unloader fitting and accessories. So I'm just going to move over um, to looking at the fitting camera. Um, and we're just going to talk you through a standard fitting of the brace. Okay, so um, we've got Pete here um, and we're just going to go through a standard fitting. But before we do that, we're just going to take a quick measurement of his leg. So we start with the leg straight. So in this case, we'll get you to stand up, Pete. Um, and we're going to find mid patella. Replacing the tape measure, the center of mid patella, passing the tape measure down, and we want to measure at 15 centimeters below mid patella. So we're passing the tape measure round, taking our measurement, and in the case of Pete, um, this comes in at about 38, okay? Um, and then we then compare this to a sizing chart and then fit the correct brace. We do have lateral versions as well as medial versions, um, but in this case, Pete has a medial compartment issue. Okay, um, we now have our brace. Um, so our brace is uh, in the box there. If we just get rid of that one. And you can see it comes with the, the straps um, in position. And with this, um, let me just adjust this one quickly. You can see the straps are pretty long. So we need to make some adjustments to that before we start. So what we're gonna do is get our patient in the correct position. So often you need them to slide forward a little bit and then just straighten the leg like that okay so I'm just going to undo the brace either side we're placing the frame on an into position and what we need to do is just make sure that we've got the hinge position correctly so one of the key areas um, that, that patients often have problems is making sure that we've got that in the correct position hinge position is probably the cause of sort of 80 to 90 percent of the problems that we that, that we might see so really making sure that we've got this lined up level with the kneecap and halfway between the front and the back of the knee is really, really a point important. So ideally, if Pete was to bend his knee, you can see that it will actually stay in position and follow in line with the center of the knee like that. You straighten again, Pete. The thing to check is that we haven't got it too externally rotated because as we bend the knee, you can see that it shifts in towards the knee like that. And equally go straight, Pete. 
if we position it to internally rotated as we flex can you see the hinge is pushed out more medially so we need to make sure it nice and straight that we've got it in line with the axis of the knee okay um, we're bringing the strap round either side and you can see that we're fastening this blue on blue here so if we just straighten your leg again pete but we're going to need to go a little bit more laterally and you can see that there's a blue marker here like that um, there's also a little shelf here um, so it's really important um, it's really important that we've got that in the correct position and it's sat like that onto that uh, strap section uh, either side next when we go to fasten the top um, we're going to bend the knee okay um, and pass this one round and what we're just going to do is fasten this yellow on yellow clip that one into position and I'm just going to tighten both these horizontal straps first of all okay so you can trim these if needed but I'm just fastening these into position Okay, so um, these are a little bit loose at the moment, but what I'm gonna do is get Pete to stand, turn and face the other way, and I'm just gonna tighten these up either side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm intentionally making an error here, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, so I'm just tightening these up. You can see these are incredibly long. Okay, so we're getting these nice and tight, and it's just sitting uh, away from the skin. And when, as I'm doing this, I'm just making adjustments um, to this popliteal pad, adjusting it either side, and just bringing it into position like that. Now, what's really important is that we don't sort of set up the brace in this position. So can you see that we've got double thicknesses of strap in the popliteal region? So if Pete was to flex, you can see there's a lot of bunching, there's a lot of material in behind the knee. So what we want to do is bring these straps back out towards this region and remove this excess uh, of straps. So um, if you're concerned about trimming them, what's important is that you use these um, crocodile Velcro sections. I can actually just fold this over, fasten that into position but you can see we've brought it back way out of the popliteal region we'd actually um, perhaps go a little bit shorter on that one but we'll adjust this one and at this stage we've got these um, sitting flush on the skin in position and we've normally got five to six centimeter uh, gap or excess of strap so if you're just trial fitting these you can leave those long but once we've we're sure we're happy with the strap length we can just quickly trim these either side uh, and just make adjustments to that. So I've got my scissors handy. I'm just gonna quickly trim this either side and then fasten that over the top. I'm gonna make a quick adjustment to this one. Trim this one. Place our crocodile Velcro over the top and fasten that. Now, so what we need to do next is just tension it back up. So Pete, take a seat again. We'll flex the knee and we can use these smart dosing sections in order to adjust it. So in most individuals, we'd have it at five. So I'm just gonna tighten that to five. And as we check the strap tension, we straighten the knee and you can see that I can just check the tension of these straps. So ideally, what we'd want is just about be able to get our finger underneath the strap. It's a hard thing to describe um, uh, over a visual um, medium, but you can see we should just about be able to get those straps in tension. Um, and I'm just gonna adjust those very slightly. If you've got them too tight, you might find that the patient will say that they're not actually able to fully straighten their legs. So just be aware of that. And because we're using these smart dosing sections just to get it in the correct position, you can make adjustments to it. So I know, because I've got this one at six, that I need to tighten that strap um, by that corresponding amount. So about three three to four mil before I finish the fitting at the end. Okay, so we've got a nice good fit here. If we can get Pete to have a stand, we've got that in position. And what we're gonna do now is just go over to the mobile camera and have a look at Pete uh, having a walk. Okay, so with this, um, you can see that as Pete actually walks, um, we've got uh, the, the changing of tension in those straps. So when he flexes, the tension reduces in those dynamic force straps um, and it's in line with the where the position is of the osteoarthritis within the knee. 
Okay, so we've got a good normal fit uh, of the brace there, and we can then go on to talk about when and how you'd use some of the accessories um, that we have for the unloader. So these accessories allow you to accommodate uh, and suit the brace to different patient groups. So we've got solutions for patients that have got sensitive skin. We've equally got solutions for patients that, that, that need um, improved suspension if they're highly active um, or for example, um, they're, they're getting any slippage. So we have our brace here, exactly as was fitted to, to Pete. This is a smart dosing version. There is an original version as well. Um, but I'm just gonna start first of all by talking through um, a few of the different parts on the brace. So if we turn this the other way up, you can see that we have a Sensil silicon liner here. This is a standard one as fitted on the smart dosing unloader. We also have a dose skin liner at the top. So the reason for this is we're anchoring this on the calf, holding that in position, um, and the thigh section is normally a little bit looser. Um, so it allows it just to shift uh, and really anchor in position over the gastro. The top of the gastroc is really the main area where we can anchor a brace. So um, it's important that we have those. You can also see that we've got a popliteal pad and it does come with a spare one of those included in the kit. Um, there are also um, these half moon uh, uh, shaped pads here and what these ones are for is actually for if you've got a patient that you're concerned they're going to tamper or, or undo the straps you can see that these would come unclicked if they wanted to to mess with those you can actually place those in and it stops the patient from actually being able to modify the strap configuration so you just pop that in and you can see that it prevents that from being removed okay um, so, looking at the different liners that we have, um, there are different ones for the for the tibia. Um, um, there are different ones for the tibia. So, looking at the bottom, we have a doe skin liner, exactly the same as the one we have on the thigh. We also have the original uh, Sensil silicon one. And looking at the thigh liners, um, we also have full uh, Sensil silicon ones as well. So, if that's something that you wanted, um, you can actually replace these liners. Um, with, with those. Um, so what I'm going to do first of all is talk about some of the different options um, if you're getting migration. So starting at the top with the AMS system wrap or anti-migration system wrap. Um, so this one actually replaces the tibial liner. So as I remove um, the tibial liner here, I can replace that with the AMS wrap. So you can see that this is a very similar shape to that, but it incorporates a gastroc strap. So that wraps round um, and then fastens over the top of the gastroc. So I'm placing that back round into position exactly as I would have before. And you can see that this fastens uh, around and holds it into position. So I'm quickly gonna fit that to, to, to Pete. Okay, um, so you can see when you actually come to fit this one, um, we're placing this onto the leg, starting with the leg straight. Okay, bringing this into position exactly the same as we would before, hinge in line with the kneecap, halfway between the front and the back of the knee, and we're just fastening this gastroc uh, strap as part of the AMS wrap either side. So you can see if I hold these out of the way, and if Pete was to stand up, you can see that it fully anchors the whole brace in position um, and keeps it uh, there. Um, so it just means we're anchoring on top of the calf um, in order to maintain suspension. Can be really useful for patients of high activity level um, or if they're getting quite a lot of sweating. Okay, and when we, once we've, we've anchored that, we just continue to fit it in our normal way, fastening blue on blue on top of that little shelf, fastening it into position, bend the knee, clip that in, and we're then good to go. So you can see it fits in exactly the same way and fits underneath the brace. Okay, um, from there, we're gonna go back to the table and talk about the um, gastroc strap. Um, so with this, um, there's an extra kit that utilizes the frame in order to add a gastroc strap. So if we're wanting to use one of the doe skin liners like these, we need to add an alternative method of suspension. So um, with that, um, we bring our brace in, um, we remove our liner. So in this case, we had the AMS wrap 
in there um, and we we can place in our doe skin tibial liner so this one uh, fits into position either side attaches in and you can now see that we've got dual doe skin on both the thigh and on the tibial section as well so whenever we do this we need to prepare an alternative method of suspension so the gastroc strap actually uh, has a connection here so can you see that and this utilizes the same twist fit technology that we use on the Velcro connections. So if I remove one of these Velcro connections on, uh, from the frame, I can, there we go. Um, so you can see with the Velcro connections, they don't have any adhesive on them. They mechanically attach into the frame like that either side. So we place that in and we can use any of these vents um, either side of the, 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 the frame place that through twist fit and it will just attach into position this will then come round to the other side and then we then have this small button which connects in and again you can choose where you would like this this brings round and then clips into position the patient has a finger loop in order to attach this so this is size adjustable we've already trimmed this one to fit uh, in this case um, and we also have a pad that we can add to this. So there's either a Sensil one or there's a doe skin one. So in this case, I'm going to use the doe skin one, place that into position um, just so that we can, we can fasten that. Okay, um, so we're going to bring this round and then fit this on Pete. Okay, we're starting with a, with a straight leg um, and we're placing this onto the leg like that. Strap into position, bringing this one round, and then clipping that one into position. So we're using that finger loop. And if we get Pete to stand, bring this one round, you can see that we've anchored it into position. I need to make a small adjustment to my gastroc strap. That's a little bit out of position there, but you can see that that's holding that in position there. Um, so we're getting another method of suspension and we then fit the brace exactly as we would have done before. Now, one of the last accessories we need to talk you through, just do the last few steps with this, um, is, this is the sleeve. Um, so we're gonna go back over to the table. Um, and just talk you through uh, the sleeve. There are different sizes of these according to uh, the size of unloader that you use. Um, so these are sized to be uh, exactly the same, um, similar color to, as we have with the unloader, and it's uh, a lycra-based material. It does have a small section of silicon at the top. This has this uh, protective covering on that. Um, so we're now going to take this over to Pete um, and then begin to fit the brace um, with this sleeve underneath. So the useful thing for the sleeve is it means it can control soft tissue. So if your patient's got a lot of excessive tissue, um, sort of muffin top sort of situation over the straps, it can control that. And also it's a way of protecting the skin from any shearing forces from the strap. We're going to go over and fit this. Um, so I'm going to give this sleeve to Pete. He's going to place it over his leg and you can see he folded the silicon over before he actually brings it up nice and high, folds the silicon over at the top and that helps to, to maintain suspension. And when we come to fit the brace, remember that whenever you're using the sleeve, it's important to, to add an alternative method of suspension. So in this case, we're using the gastroc strap, bringing that one into position and clicking it there. Okay, um, so um, it's Im important to think about a few other sort of different issues that we might come up with. Um, so very occasionally you can end up with sort of redness um, in this area. That's a common area um, that we can end up with, uh, with an area of redness there. So what's really important um, is that we're checking the hinge position. So what is very common when we've got an area of redness here is actually that the brace has been fitted a little bit too low. So I'm exaggerating, but you can see my hinge position is here. The patella is here. Um, so what happens is as they flex and extend, you will get sort of slight wiggling and surface movement of the frame. So it's really important that we double check we've got that frame in the correct position 
correct position AP. Another area can be the, the, tibial, uh, the tibial crest along the front there. Um, so there's a couple of things to check with this, and that's normally to do with the hyperextension that the patient has. So very occasionally, um, the patient has got um, higher levels of, of hyperextension. You can see that the brace is designed to stop at zero. Um, so it is sometimes uh, necessary um, to adjust the stop in here just to allow a little bit of hyperextension. And if in, if in those situations, Situations you need to, to do that just contact us and we can send you an extra stop that allows a degree of hyperextension um, and just allows it to conform to that shape one of the other things you can also do is apply a small piece of padding built in between uh, just add padding in between the frame and the liner and just pad either side of the tibia so that gives you an option to offload that area Okay, um, so it just remains to say thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, if you've got any um, sort of further questions, our contact details are on there um, and you can contact customer care or either one of us uh, with regards to any questions. Thanks very much for joining us and we'll let you know about any uh, further webinars uh, that we have running in the future. Thanks very much. <laughs>